I am starving on prep and I don't know what to do to the rescue GLP one. That's the hot topic, semaglutide. And so today, Luke and I have on Jeffrey Sue with First Call Out Fitness. Excellent coach, works with a ton of lifestyle clients, um, functional health, also competitors. Uh, he has experience with semaglutide, and we want to have him on to just inform us, educate us, and learn everything there is to, to know about this and if we should even use it or is it not a tool. And so welcome, Jeffrey, to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. This is great. It's a yeah. uh, it's an awesome awesome opportunity because you know I've met you both apparently <laughs> <laughs> in, in Dallas and in Nashville. Although my memory wasn't serving me correctly when I, when we first signed on this morning, but really appreciate being here. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, we Je Jeffrey and I we we met the Physique Education Collective and yes. have both presented in, in lecture topics and just uh, extremely well-versed in all this information, especially the functional health side. So I think there's a application for what we're going to pull today for the GLP ones for whether you're just general and weight loss, um, even diabetics, if there's the application there or for, yeah. for physique. So, so Jeff, you, if you want to just kick us off with the, the background of GLP one agonist and anywhere you yeah. want to start and, and guide there, if it's the background or, or, or mechanisms of just kind of where yeah. this lies. All right. So semaglutide is, you know, better known as Ozempic. Ozempic would be the trade name for it. Um, and it's one of many drugs or classes of drugs that are used to manage hyperglycemia or type two diabetes. Um, Semaglutide in particular is called a GLP-1-RA. And what that means is a glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist. And I will explain what all that stuff means. But, you know, the GLP-1-RAs are a class of drugs that improves the sensitivity um, of the beta cells, okay, mm -hmm. to glucose that is inject ingested. So it is glucose dependent. Um, among the other classes of drugs would be the sulfonylureas, like glipizide, and that encourages the beta cells to release insulin that is quote unquote trapped by messing with the potassium and, and ion channels to open the cell up and allow that hormone to be released. And then finally, you have a, a class of drugs called biguanides, and there are a few um, in that drug class, but metformin is the only one that is clinically safe and effective because the other ones cause such high amounts of lactic acid buildup because the way biguanides work is that they basically stifle ADP, ATP production. Um, and that's how it stops gluconeogenesis in the liver. And the, a byproduct is produced, which is quote unquote cytotoxic. And that's, you know, lactic acid. It can cause lactic acidosis. So there's a quick background. <laughs> yeah yeah so and i guess these were originally deployed clinically for diabetics correct that was their yeah. initial purpose yes so um you know it's glucagon like peptide receptor agnes let's go back to that terminology right so receptors are on all cells of our body think of it like the, like a key or a lock like on your door the key goes into it and the key is usually like a hormone and then the receptor is the lock. So hormone meets receptor, an action occurs, opens the door and things happen in the body. Just think of it that way. So the word agonist is something that basically is a copy of the key. So it does the same thing to the receptor in the same way that the original hormone would do. That's what an agonist is. And then you also have, you have antagonists, which prevent the key from acting as it should, or the receptor as it should. So GLP-1RA is now a copy of the real thing. So what is the real thing? The real thing is glucagon-like peptide 1, which is an incretin. It's a hormone that's secreted by your lower or your smaller intestine. And it's part of a couple of incretins. There's the main two are GLP-1, and there's another one called GIP, mm -hmm. which is um, glucose-dependent insulin-tropic polypeptide. It's quite a mouthful. Yeah, wow. And these, got it. These are released by um, 
their um, cells, like, like there's, there's cells called like K cells and L cells in your small intestine. The K cells are proximal, meaning they're closer to your mouth. And then the L cells are distal. They're further away from your mouth, still in the small intestine, but closer to your, to your large intestine. And so the K cells will release GIP, which isn't a good thing. And we can talk about that later. And the L cells are responsible for release, releasing GLP-1. And what these incretins do, think of it this way, incretin increases beta cell production of insulin in response to glucose. Okay. So w within these populations, are, are we seeing a dysregulation of those hormones to where they're not having adequate G GLP-1 yes. or is it more of a receptor site desensitization? It's both, both because yeah. okay. in let's say populations, you know, let's say, you know, you're dealing with menopausal women or you're dealing with women with PCOS, there's a lot of obesity or inflammation that drives obesity that sort of blankets these two populations. Like if you look at it like, like, a, like a Venn diagram, what do these populations all have in common? They all intersect in a, an area where, you know, there's inflammation or there's obesity. So when there's inflammation, think of a think of inflammation like a piece of bubble gum that's jammed into a lock and you can't get that key open. You know, so that's one way that, you know, insulin resistance occurs and insulin sensitivity declines. And then another um, factor to inflammation is the cytokine response, which is largely mediated by gut bacteria, um, like acromantia or escherichia, like E. coli, or something called um, uh, intestinal bacteria, something I-N-S-T-I-N-I, -I -I, something like that. Um, and so these are like little switches that control like TNF alpha or J and K, IKK, these are all like cytokines that are released by the immune system. So that's what's going on. And that's how these drugs sort of play a role to, to mediate the situation. Okay. So that's, that's how these came to be. Now there's not just GLP one receptors in the gut as well. They're also spread out throughout the body. If yes. it, it might be pertinent to, to, to bring up those as well, because um, these drugs can cross the blood brain bar barrier and, and uh, have impacts on like the brain as well. Oh, absolutely. So, so it's not just the fact that, you know, GLP one receptor agonists can, you know, play a role in releasing that insulin or increasing insulin release, but they also slow down gastric emptying. So you feel fuller longer. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that in your body, like you said just now, John, there are receptors for GIP and GLP in your brain, in the hypothalamus. And so that's how it regulates satiety and controls hunger. So people who are on Ozempic, they tend to eat less. And then they can then, you know, partake in fasting or keto and all that without, you know, wanting to eat as much. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there for now and then let you guys guide the convo. No, 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 that that's, that's perfect. I, I think like, how, how this would work for that population for mm -hmm. diabetics, for one, mm -hmm. improving hyperglycemia, mm -hmm. but then it also along with diabetics, weight loss comes about and that's where it's spurred on for use in obesity as a weight loss drug too. Um, on the topic of the brain, because I think that's really interesting aspect is that it does cause sati, but also was reading that it causes, um, a, a decrease like in the reward system of the brain yes. so even yes. like the drive of thought of like what this food's gonna do for you because it impacts dopamine levels yes that's yes. changed some too right yes it does affect dopamine levels although the mechanisms aren't well understood mm -hmm. there's a weird thing about these drugs right and and for me like you know i don't know how drugs like go through clinical trials and eventually are used on populations and then marketed but it seems like scientists and doctors don't even know exactly all the mechanisms of yeah. metformin, for example, never mind GLP-1 RAs, but yet they're on the market. So we're basically running real life clinical trials on everyone. And especially now that Ozempic has made its way into the fitness community, of course, everyone in the fitness community wants an edge, right? And we love experimenting, bodybuilders love experimenting on drugs. And 
But the unfortunate truth is, if you read a lot of the studies that have been done on following patients that are on semaglutide a year later, a lot of them regain about 75% of the weight that they initially lost. However, the, the silver lining here is that all of the internal improvements like to lipids, to inflammation, all that stuff, they are retained. So that's a good thing. Yeah. So, so even some body fat weight comes back on, there's still like health benefits still present. Yes. Now, do you think that's just that at the time they pulled these markers that if they stay at this high body fat level long enough, like these markers will get deranged again? Or, or uh, do, you, do you recall that like to pull that out? Or is that just as much as we know for right now? You, you know, when you think about so, so let's think about that, right? So someone, someone can be fat and obese, mm -hmm. but still have good markers, just like you could have someone who is lean and not have good markers, like in bodybuilding, for example, sure. you can have someone who's on the stage looking great and you think their labs would be perfect, but their AST is like 300 and their LDL is like 200, right? Just like women with lean PCOS, they can present normally, but they still have that dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia and, and hyperglycemia. So it's a, it's a difference between the the physio physiological contributions of obesity and then the external manifestation that is physical that we can see. Those two don't always go hand in hand. Mm. Oh, very, very good. And do you, do you recall about any of the, cause I, I know like with deploying this, there's some early evidence around eating disorders or binge eating with its use, but I don't think it's approved for those conditions through the FDA right now. We just have like some yeah. earlier trials that I, at least that I have seen in as far as what that means psychologically for people that have deployed this, that do have food issues once it removed is, are any of those habits retained or is it just the drug yeah. works when it's present? Yeah. Well, you know, the GLP-1 RAs have been around for maybe like five, seven years, I want to say in medical literature. That's what it says. It was approved in like 2019, I think, for type 2 diabetes. Mm, okay. And I know for a fact that this year so far, because I'm teaching a class on PCOS, that it has not been approved for PCOS, but coaches are using it for PCOS. Okay. Now, back to your question about, you know, lifestyle and habits and things like that. Absolutely. Um, those usually aren't in place. People are just taking this pill or this injection because it's available in both ways. And they're using it, they're getting great results. And then when they inevitably stop for whatever reason, all the weight comes back because they don't have any of those habits in place. So it has okay. to be concurrent. Yeah. I was going to ask too, because like some of the, you brought some of the KSL l cell stuff. A lot of that is largely influenced by like dietary habits as well, correct? Correct me if I'm Yeah, because so if we go back and talk about that physiology again, so I said that the K cells are located in the upper part of the intestine, small intestine, the L cells are located in the lower half. And I always say K is bad because it's like you're texting a girl and she says K, you know that's not a good sign, <laughs> right? So K is bad, L is good, it means she loves you. So think of it nice. that way. <laughs> yeah. So when you think of, when you consume, you know, carbohydrates, right? When you, when you consume jelly beans from Halloween, all right, or candy corn, if you like candy corn, it's going to break down pretty fast and probably interact with those bad K cells more than the L cells. And so those K cells release GIP, which has been known to support inflammation and drive inflammation and yeah. drive hunger signaling and make you crave more versus if you ate that bowl of oatmeal with some almond butter to slow it down, it probably bypasses, digest slowly, interacts more with the L cells. You get more GLP-1 release, right? And beta cell um simulation from that. So insulin is more controlled then it's not, doesn't spike and, and come down. So there has been a lot of debate in the scientific and medical community that is it really carbs that are bad or is it how our body reacts to the food that we eat? So inherently food isn't bad. It's what it does to our cells that initiates a good or bad response. So that's, that's really interesting stuff. Oh, yep. And so with, with that being said, with taking the G, uh, like GLP-1 agonist, does it have an impact on GIP and like K-cell function? Completely there, independent. 
it's it's independent because it's it's just two completely different in Cretan hormones that mm -hmm. are secreted. Um, there is another hormone that is um, it's called DPP four di dipeptyl peptase, I, I think. And DPP four is like the it's like the water that puts out the fire. And so you have GLP one that it causes cells to you know the beta cells to release insulin act on cells, then DPP-4 is all over like every cell in our body and it stops that response. So it's like a control mechanism. Like our body has on and off switches, right? So it's yeah. an off switch. And so that has to do with GLP-1 RA. Um, but as far as I know, I don't think GIP interacts in, in any way. They're completely different. And then on, on the the stuff you cited earlier about like gaining 75% of the weight back, I'm assuming there was no dietary intervention within those populations that had the semaglutide use, correct? You know, that's the problem with, um, you know, these type of studies, like unless you put people like in a prison, like in a glass box <laughs> and you literally feed them. Like, I wish I could do that to some of my clients, like, literally, <laughs> like imprison them in my basement and feed them the macros that I prescribe them. <laughs> But like, unless you do that, you can't control right. like these studies. And that's why they're, um, they're not completely accurate. They, they never will be. Like yeah. we, we could, you could crap on any weight loss drug. If like you remove it and then like, Hey, they gained all their weight back. Oh, that's a shitty drug. It's like, yeah. most people do like most diets fail. Like most interventions are going to fail just simply because people go back to what they were right. doing prior. So it, it doesn't, yeah. I guess remove the the application for this drug when it's present but no i was trying to make. so what well so there's a lot of benefits right um yes decreased gastric emptying uh increased sensitivity for beta cells better control for our for uh, blood glucose sounds like it has benefits for cardiovascular system with lowering yep. inflammation and then the their neuroprotective aspects around it too so there's all these all the benefits with the GLP-1 agus that would be present for someone with type 2 diabetes, someone that's obese that has this central role of inflammation that's present, right? Um, there has to be some downsides too. So is, is there any negatives to this magic drug that's just recently been on market? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if you talk about the gastric emptying, right? And then especially when you're combining it with like metformin and you're really changing the, uh, the gut biome, um, get, slow gastric emptying isn't a good thing. If you have a, let's say a PCOS or a perimenopausal client with gut issues already, and you're slowing their gastric emptying when their motility is already complete shit and they literally can't shit more than, you know, twice a week, you know, you're causing, you're going to probably cause more problems than good. Um, the other thing is that they have tied some glutide or GLP-1 RA use to a specific um, thyroid cancer. Mm. I don't mm. know how or why the mechanism behind that, but that's been listed as a risk factor as well. Um, there's also disturbances in like renal function, kidney function, um, because it obviously is, you know, process, especially if you take it orally, it's gonna, you know, affect those systems. But again, doctors and researchers don't really know why or how that happens. And, and potentially um, a pancreatitis. Yes. Yeah. I saw too. I saw someone reporting like, oh yeah, I took this like years ago and I had a bout of, of pancreatitis that it flared up. And I think that's more of a rare occurrence, but nonetheless, it's. Yeah. I, I mean, it could be um, contradicted with, with patients, obviously with impaired renal function or older populations where, you know, their organ function in general, isn't that great. Um you know, same thing with, with metformin, you know, with the, the lactic acidosis risk. So. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the, the worst occurrence is GI distress, um, nausea, vomiting in mm -hmm. some individuals. Yeah. Uh, not, yeah. not completely that far different from metformin because metformin has some action around GLP one. It does. It enhances the effects of GLP one. Um, that's why these, you know, metformin is usually the first line of defense against any sort of prediabetes. Yeah. 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 So combining the two, uh, beware, right. It might, it might uh, yeah. your, your starting dosages might need to be adjusted. Accordingly. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
oral semaglutide seems to be the choice because a lot of, you know, gen pop, you know, let's say you got a 45 year old woman who, you know, she does not want to inject things into her body, you know, um, bodybuilders probably a different story, right? So you probably start with like, it's like five milligrams of um, Ozempic and you can titrate up to 20. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with metformin, you know, it's usually like 500 milligrams, you know, twice a day. Um, there's no benefit in going over 2000. You're probably going to increase that risk of the lactic acidosis, but titration in a slow and controlled manner is the best way to alleviate any sort of um, GI risk. And, and what do you see dosing for the injectable version? Um, injectable version, one milligram per okay. week. And that's always starting, like that's a reasonable start point? Reasonable start point. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And what, what do people need to go higher or where, where do you? I have not seen anybody go higher in the research that I've dug up on this stuff. It's all been off, off of oral and people have gone up to 20 milligrams per day. Mm, okay. so like terms of subcutaneous injection, one milligram seems to be the standard for eight to 12 weeks. So, yeah. you know, with all that being said, there's benefits, there's obvious risks doing that benefit to risk analysis and, and, and the, where do we find the application? And I, again, like with our population, we talked to are mainly competitors interested in fat loss, some not competitors, but mm. do you, do you see an application for the drug in that population where they, this is someone without diabetes, with, no. with not obese. I don't think semaglutide is a drug to be used to gain an edge off of. It's almost like people who think that smoking CBD is going to increase their HRV because it provides better sleep. That's not true. It provides better sleep. If let's say you have chronic neck pain and you're in pain, that's keeping you up. The CBD will ease that and then you get better sleep. But if you're already sleeping normal, it's not like you're just going to get like even better sleep. You know, <laughs> so glutide is not going to make you even leaner if you can already diet and do the cardio. So that's where bodybuilders can go wrong. But in cases of, you know, hypothalamic dysregulation or, uh, or appetite control dysregulation, then some glutide can give you the edge to buy you time to work on the basics and maybe find a coach to help you with that. And then you come off the drug and you've got the basics there now in place. So would you say it'd be warranted in like the post-show phase? Because that's a lot of the questions that we get with these GLP-1. Uh, I mean, for me personally, like I, I, my guy just came off of his show, right? And we're, yeah. we're rebounding right now. I wouldn't use this in, in the post-show phase because honestly, if you're a serious competitor, don't be an asshole in, in your off season. You know how to eat, you know? That's my, that's my take on it. Would it work? Yeah, it probably suppressed appetite, but so would nicotine, you know, so would Adderall. Um, you got a lot of bodybuilders using those two during prep too. Do I recommend that? I definitely do not. Right. Yes. Because <clears throat> what I, where we coach some people that are competitors, they're in the, the depths of prep and yeah. hunger is uncontrollable. And you have those individuals that have to get so far away from that set point Mm -hmm. that I'm sure it's extremely challenging to, to stay in that level, even with all things managed well. And that's when like, I like when new people that I haven't coached before stuff starts like rearing its head of like, Oh, wow, this has some eating disorder mm -hmm. symptomology around it that yes. I never would have exposed otherwise until we're in that situation. And that's when I see this is a, a real gray area for it. Cause it's like, well, you can deploy it and control hunger more and that like pleasure reward to try to like get that dopamine release. However, this, this is a serious issue with that person that you just uncovered. How, do, how would you manage the waters there of, of, of that? And I know that's a tough one, but. Yeah. If anyone has any sort of eating disorder tendencies, number one, I wouldn't prep them. And then in terms of just general application, I certainly wouldn't use a drug like this. I would do my best to coach them. And then if needed, you know, obviously refer out to an eating disorder therapist to help them. But in any situation where somebody is attracted to the allure of starvation or they find control or comfort in restriction, this is not a good way to do it. This is like a drug that will encourage that and facilitate a, a dopamine reward 
by restricting. Because usually when people restrict with eating disorders, they inevitably binge and they feel guilt and then the cycle continues. But in this way, in using some glutide, they may never get that, that bad part of the eating disorder. So they continue and continue, but every action has a reaction in life. And I feel like when you're messing with so many systems at once, because some of had GLP-1 RAs, GLP touches on so many different areas of the body. We are messing with control systems that we have no idea what that reaction will be down the line, especially dopamine reward systems. Yeah, I, I agree in that. I think if you have someone where something that serious pops up, it is a time to pull back and not just keep going because the, the back end off of prep could be devastating for that individual. Um, now the other instance where I see it used is like, Hey, I'm hungry. I'm prep. I just don't want to be hungry. And I, I think it's been an easy go-to w- without doing yeah. the hard work of like, Hey, there's dietary manipulations to work. There's fatigue management strategies. Maybe you just need a longer timeline and not such an aggressive fat loss rate. Yeah. Um, I, I guess you're seeing a lot of it used just for that. Like, Hey, I want an easier prep. I just, you know, with clients in general, with my competitors, okay, because I've competed, you know, several times. I haven't competed since 2019, but I'm a guy that loves to suffer. <laughs> like, it could be due to childhood trauma or whatever, but I love getting my ass beat and just feeling like shit and wearing that badge. Like, I can do it. You can't. Like, that's an ego thing, right? But for me, like, I just tell my my guys or women, I'm like, listen, this sport isn't for you. Go fucking do golf or something. Like, this is bodybuilding. You're going to suffer. You're going to work hard especially if you're going to coach with me, I'm not going to give you a fucking cheat meal every week, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> that's my take. No, uh, I agree. And it's, uh, it, and you consider like for the enhanced bodybuilder, it's like, where's, where do you draw the line? Like, I know like with the, the safer use models, right. And it's like, let's use multiple pathways, small amounts of multiple drugs to elicit yeah. response versus a bunch of one drug. And then if, if now anything that's ever been approved to use, for clinical use is on the table and yes. that's not should be the, the case would you, would you agree within that because we don't know polypharmacy how all that it would be integrated yeah you know you have the um the also almost like a moral like um i don't know how to say it but it's like it's okay if we just microdose this microdose that like let's, let's microdose dnp let's also microdose you know whatever, like mushrooms every or LSD every day, you know, like it's just, <laughs> you're just, you, you know, you're cherry picking. I feel like that's my, that's my opinion. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Um, I guess some people have brought up in, in the post-show phase, it's such a unique acute period that it would help someone get to that end point to where they are able to sustain habits. And then through experience, they could in, integrate and, and have and not lose that ground of their off season. Um, yeah. Cause that is, I think it is an experience thing in the post-show period that it takes time. Cause you don't, you have no idea what it's going to be like until you're there. Of course. Yeah. But I mean, I feel like it's a, it's kind of the coach's job though, right. Of setting that up for a person to have success and not, and the coach's job isn't take this drug. Correct. Yeah. In the post-show period, it's important. And I see this far too often where the coaching just ends like on show day, you know, the coaching should extend probably eight weeks after the show. And at least for me, every single one of my clients who competes their post-show plan training program, directions for lab work, nutrition program is in their hands before they even step on stage. So the very next day, they know exactly what they're doing. And I bring their calories right up, you know, not to like gaining, but I bring them back up to what I think their new maintenance should be. So I don't play this game of adding, you know, 10 carbs. You know, I think that was popular, like in the early 2000s, where you want to stay lean. It's like, oh, look at me, you know, eight weeks post-show, I'm still shredded. It's like, no, 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 you don't want to be still shredded. You want to be healthy, <laughs> yeah, ready to, to grow. And then you have the people who are jamming food and training and, and getting into their Aussies and blasts. I personally don't like that either because you're inflamed, you're stressed. Your system's not going to react to all that stuff. So there has to be a health period after competition. That's, that's my approach. I think there's, I think there's also an athlete development side too, from the coach's perspective that using semaglutide in that phase would potentially rob that athlete of that athlete development and character development, kind of like the reward and the guilt system that you talked about with potential eating disorder, just on a smaller scale, right? It's like, allowing that athlete with the systems in play to have that development where 
the next time they're in this position, it's managed even better with each experience that they go through it with. Absolutely. I agree with that. What do you like to do, Jeff, for the the immediate post-show night? Um, Because that can like kind of kick it off for people. I know you said you give them a plan in place, but obviously, you know, hey, have a celebratory meal. Is there some level of guidance that you give for these individuals or um, do you kind of let them have free reign until you realize it's an an issue or how how do you how do you uh, navigate that? Mm. Well, I use my my client, Eric, as an example, since, you know, he just stepped off stage last weekend. But usually we have a celebratory meal. And, you know, keep in mind throughout the day, depending on how, you know, the physique is managed, you're probably going to be having extra calories backstage or, or whatever, right? So you're already overfeeding, you know, starting on show day. Um, so we usually have a nice meal, you know, the night after the show. And then I give them a full 24 hours. The next day, you want to go get brunch, you want to get whatever for lunch, dinner, you know, have some dessert, and that's it. Then we shut it down. That's it. I don't give them more than 24 hours. And then they're on their new plan as of, you know, Monday, let's say that's it. Yeah. That's how I've got it. And of course, right. It depends on how soon they're going to be competing. Um, yes. If they compete the next week and obviously they don't have the, the eat whatever you want for the, the day. Like, you can't man, watch live, <laughs> live at the sushi buffet for 24 hours. Um, so yeah, there, I'm sure there's, yeah. there's guidance given there. I, I usually give some instruction to people too, of like some people like, uh, like to collect and hoard. And so like, I've had people buy like every flavor of Oreo pack that's out and like bring it to the show. And, and like, let's say like, don't bring anything with you. Like, um, and maybe we should have like some, somewhat of a, Hey, I'm going to go eat here. And this is what I'm going to have. But uh, yeah. I think if it's not around you, 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 you won't eat it. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's so it's so weird. I don't know about you guys when you compete, but I have never ever brought a suitcase of candy and junk food to the show in, in preparation to binge on it. <laughs> I've always been the guy to like make reservations at some nice, I love like, like a fancy steak dinner or like sushi or like, you know, some like fancy restaurant that I can get dressed up like a normal human being after living in gym clothes for the last 16, 20 weeks and go out and feel normal again and feel like relaxed. That's what I want. I don't want to eat Reese's cups and, and Swedish fish in my hotel room after the show. You, you know, that's, <laughs> that's my preference. <laughs> Yeah, I've been the same way. I want to go out to a dinner or something and maybe grab yeah. some some treats or something to to have, but that's that kind of it. I I've always such a planner too, and I think that's what I've instilled in clients as well. So like I've already planned out my next show bef- before I'm even off stage, right? So I already have yeah. a goal in mind and realizing, man, I need to take the next steps immediately. So I'm almost the person that gets on a plan maybe maybe quicker than it needs to be. Um, and so I think that's, what's important for your clients of laying out like goals before, or I saw you talking on desires and then we have goals laid out right, uh, before we even, even off stage, but to get back to semi-glutide, because I think that's important because people are saying, well, Hey, if I don't take this drug, how am I going to manage like my hunger? Yeah. Now that's at least the competitor realm, but I do want to touch on where you see application or if you've used it in any other areas where it does have benefit and application. Yeah. Mm. Well, in clients with PCOS, it would probably have the most application because, you know, we've covered the gastric emptying, right? Assuming there's no GI issues. We've covered how it, you know, sensitizes the beta cells to release insulin glucose dependent, okay? Because some of pe- some people out there who are very well educated in, in pharmacology and physiology might be wondering, why would you want to have a PCOS woman take a drug that increases insulin when we know that insulin is what causes the fecal cell produ- production of more androgens? Well, my answer to that is that it is glucose dependent. You are not just jacking up insulin on its own, which is a completely different animal, Right. So, but the other thing it does is that it increases something called SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. It's a, it's an acute protein released by the liver. It's a carrier, a transporter of primarily testosterone or androgens, right? And so in, in women with PCOS, they're usually very low in SHBG, which is why their free testosterone can be high. 
And so this drug also increases that and binds up those androgens so that they don't wreak havoc and cause hirsutism or any of those other symptoms of acne and other things that women with PCOS get. I guess the, the role too, just like you mentioned earlier, lowering inflammation, because a lot of this is yes. in, inflammatory driven. Uh, yes. You, you mentioned SHBG, which it brings my mind back to the female who's relatively healthy, normal. Uh, could you see elevated SHBG in someone like that, where then you have lower free testosterone, which maybe you would be mm. less productive for their muscle endeavors? Yes. Well, you know, with women, as women age, you know, as, as most men and women age, you know, SHBG levels tend to climb a little bit. Um, women in general will have more SHBG anyway. Um, you know, about 80% of their total testosterone is bound by SHBG. Um, a good, you know, I would say 15% is by albumin and the rest is free. And of course, women have lower levels of testosterone in general. So that's why their free is so much lower. So yeah. in men, SHBG isn't as high, but we also have higher total testosterone. Um, as we age though, and that's part of perimenopause, SHBG levels get higher. So women's levels get lower. That's why you have lower sex drive, lower aromatase conversion to estrogen. And then they have all those other symptoms. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So there's a, there's a, a maybe around there. I also see that'd be pretty problematic for maybe the female very reactive on birth control, increasing mm -hmm. SHBG also have yes. GI issues. You add some glutatide to that, have more GI distress, Probably yeah. More and yeah, birth control. <laughs> Jeez, that's like a whole nother like can yeah. of worms because there's so many different types of birth control. And yeah. yeah, it increases a lot of these acute phase proteins like TBG, thyroid binding globulin goes down. I mean, goes up. So you have lower thyroid hormone. Thyroid. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, definitely. I, I see dyslipidemia, high tri triglycerides, high LDL. Um, that's why a lot of birth control, as you read the package, it increases the risk of stroke. It's because it you know, it, it messes up your lipid panel. Yeah, I know that is a can of worms, but it just goes to show you that th these drugs shouldn't just be deployed across the board for everyone. Um, right. And that there's going to be risk and actually it could have a, a detriment with other things that you might be taking. So within the PCOS population, benefit potential there with certain applications, right? Those without GI issues. Mm -hmm. um, any Anyone else that comes to mind because i know we mainly use you have general lifestyle clients and mm. it is approved drug for obesity because i've had i've had some friends message me that were like yeah i went to the hrt clinic they prescribe you know some glutatide yeah. and um, to loot, cut some weight off and so but again like we said most people gain it back right so it's not instilling the habits that need to take place so if it is used, I'd say you probably need to have all the other interventions that are taking place, but do you mm -hmm. lean still towards not deploying it for those individuals? I would lean still, I would lean towards not deploying it for general population clients. Mm -hmm. These people just need to get their habits and priorities in line. They are in, they, they shouldn't be taking even metformin in my opinion. Um, and you have to wonder why some glutide has gotten so much popularity as Ozempic because you know, exenatide and liraglutide, they've been around for years. Those, those are other GL, GLP-1 inhibitors, but we never got to the type of fame and fortune that these clinics and other, you know, doctors or whatever are making off of prescribing Ozempic. So why is that? Why did this drug, you know, of all the GLP-1 inhibitors get so much press? I don't know. You know, maybe because Kim Kardashian took it. I think I think that's what happened. Is that it? Because that would probably could be it. I, <laughs> that I, would be that, I honestly think she was the first celebrity to take it. And then all of a sudden the, uh, the Silicon Valley, you know, CEOs and executives, that was in the news that this is like the new drug of Silicon Valley, you know, of Hollywood. And then of course it got picked up by the fitness world as it usually does. Mm. No, that's, that is interesting how these things come to be. Because you're right, the, the, there's several other GFP1 agus that have been around yeah. for a period of time. Yeah. So I don't know. I think, I think it's another one of these, like, you know, flash in a pan, you know, miracle drugs that we won't be talking about anymore in two to three years. And I just think that, you know, in our industry, in our social media, fast paced industry, where everyone is a coach, everyone has a clinic, 
you know, not all clinics are bad, but, you know, everyone, you know, there are more clinics out there now doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, we're going to see a rebound in our entire population and it's not going to be a good thing. I, th I think it's um, maybe an important point to bring up about where you're taking information from when you're getting this type of like about semaglutide, like, yeah. is there a background of someone like that's selling it somewhere? Right. So it's usually like uh, maybe you own a research peptide site or an HRT clinic. And so there's another motive there. Cause I see like with peptides, all yeah. kinds of peptides getting promoted that some haven't even been like, even barely put into a rat and it, they're getting prescribed by doctors. I'm like, how is that even happening? Um, yeah. And so it's like, yeah, who, what's the motive behind the information? Like for us here, like we simply want to be better and yeah. there's no, there's no bias. You know, Luke and I don't have a secret ebook on GLP one usage. Neither do I. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> I well, might teach, yeah, I I'll think, teach a class on it. That's all I do. I'll, I'll teach a class on managing it and that, that'll be it. <laughs> there you go. All right. So it's important where we collect our information from. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's extremely well-rounded on GLP-1 yeah. and some glutatide. Uh, is, yeah. is there anything you think we, we missed or didn't cover on it that you wanted to make sure we addressed? Um, you know, I, I just I just feel like with with people listening to this, obviously they come to you guys, your podcast for information, and people are probably going to want to apply some of what we've talked about, right? So I just want people listening to know that the body is very, very complex. There are so many systems in it that are intertwined, and you really have to think about how each system, you know, connects to another one. So you know where to strike first. Like in my social media, I always call it my domino theory where if you have, let's say you have a, a circle of dominoes, right? And then like a circular shape. And one of them is heavier than all the other ones, but you don't know which one it is, right? So if you hit one of the other dominoes, they, it'll go around. You think you're making progress, 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 and boom, it hits the heaviest one, your progress stops. So you need to identify that heaviest one. So you topple that one over and then the whole chain falls. So the key to coaching is to find out where that heaviest domino is. And there are systems upon systems upon systems in a pyramid where you need to then find the heaviest domino in each. And that's what coaching essentially is. If you think of it from like an algorithmic standpoint. I think that's a, a great framework of mine to take. And, and you truly are the, the problem solver and critical thinker as a coach. It's not just take this, here you go on your way. It is trying yeah. to really dig deep and, and find, like you said, the problem domino, right? Or what's the root issue that we need to really uh, address that's going to set off the positive chain events for this individual? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, despite the science that I post and, you know, the knowledge that I've dug through and obtained, when I'm really coaching my clients, I'm just like listening to like my female 45 year old clients tell me about how they're going through a divorce and I'm supporting them emotionally and telling them to stay on track and you know, making things really simple for them to follow. And that's where I'm getting most of my progress. It's not that I'm delivering all this science, which yeah. is fun, right, to, to have a conversation about. But coaching is very, very simple. And it's just about empathy and, and managing the human side of things, not the science, I think. That can be such a lost part in coaching, too. Uh, I think yeah. as online coaching has grown, too, it's become easy to become disconnected. And it's just here's an email and you just read some text and you send something back and you lose the human connection side, which for, especially your, your general lifestyle client is, is so important, but you know, it also just shows how invested you are in someone's own, own process too. Yeah. I, I care a lot. I think it's hard to be a good coach. I think all three of us here are very great coaches and, you know, it's hard to, to get to our levels without actually caring about the people. And I care very deeply about every person I work with. Yeah, absolutely. Remember, someone told me a quote like, "No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care." Um, yeah. Some, some you you need to know what you're talking about, of course, but you need to care about people. That's why we're first after this as as a coach. So it's that uh, higher level of trying to have self development for yourself and for the people around you. Well, 
Jeff, you're excellent articulating and also a great educator. I love all the analogies and how you take complex information and can relay it in a way that doesn't lose the, the value of it, but allows people to have a great takeaway. So I know you do not only coaching individuals, but also you coach coaches and do mm-hmm. business development too. Yes. So there's a lot of areas that you, you're integrated into. So I, I love for you for, to share like where people can get more information yeah. to reach out to you for, for more help. Sure. Yeah. So I offer a coaching mentorship program. It's, it's on the technical side as well. Um, but it's also, I mean, it's not as thorough as, you know, your university, John, which I respect highly. Um, but I offer a business mentorship to help people because online coaching is, you know, online and a lot of people don't understand social media or marketing or pricing. Um, my formal education is actually in finance. Mm. So I went to a school called Bentley university and I had my undergraduate degree in finance I did eight years in corporate finance and retail and healthcare, and I got my MBA in finance. Um, so that's where that business training comes from. And so I help coaches on their businesses. Other than that, I have this class sale. It's like these, you know, they're just PowerPoint classes I teach on Zoom. Um, and there's like seven classes for sale. It's like 500 bucks for seven classes. It's like, like 14 hours worth of, you know, video information uh, for 500 bucks. So. That's a steal. Oh yeah, it charges more. Oh, yeah. listening, go do it now before he charges more with me telling him that because that that's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, so steal for what you provide. Yep, that's what I'm about. So thank you for having me on and, and having the opportunity. Yeah, well, Jeff, thanks again, everyone. Thank you for tuning in J3U podcast. We will talk to you next time.